Hi guys, so for the periodic table unit we have a couple questions, so I'm going to again number them just so that um, when I do some examples on the next page we could keep everything organized. Okay, so Joe's question, what element has the highest electronegativity and ionization energy? So um, in general, there are usually questions about trends on the periodic table. So they either will ask for going across a period or going down a group. Um, and you can either memorize the trends or you can look them up. So I'll show you um, how you can memorize them. So the atomic radius, which is the size of the atom, that goes down as you go across a period. The atoms get smaller. So that means that the ionization energy and the electronegativity, oh, can't spell, electronegativity, they both go up. So ionization and electronegativity, they do the opposite of the radius, okay? So if you can just remember one of these things, now going down a period, it's the opposite. The atomic radius gets bigger. So the ionization energy and the electronegativity, they get smaller. It's the opposite of going across a period. So if you want to find the element with the highest ionization energy and electronegativity, I know that I need to go to the right, and I know that I need to go up. So I want to look for the element that's in the top right corner. You want to ignore the noble gases because they don't lose or gain electrons because they don't react. So fluorine, if you're ignoring the noble gas column, fluorine is the furthest to the right and the furthest to the top. It's going to have the highest of those numbers, meaning that it's the most difficult to lose an electron, but it gains electrons the easiest. It's the most reactive nonmetal. Um, that's kind of complicated. You could also go to your reference tables. Um, now let's say it's an across a period question. I would pick a period. So period two right here has Li and Be. I can just go to table S and I can say, okay, Li's radius is 130 and Be's radius is 99. As I go across, the radius is going down. You could do the same thing for the ionization and the electronegativity. If the question is about down a group, again, you would, you would just pick any group on the periodic table. I like to pick group two. It has BE and MG at the top. And if you go to table S, BE's ionization energy is 900 and MG's is 738. So how do I get from 900 to 738? I go down. So you can look up any trend that you want to using table S if you prefer to do that. Okay. Um, so Andrew's question, in what way is the periodic table organized? So um, the periodic table is in atomic number order. Um, don't make the mistake of saying that it's organized by mass. Um, the mass does increase as you go left to right and top to bottom, but there are some exceptions to that. So um, this is what you want to go with. Um, back, this kind of goes with Matt's question, which is next. He wants to know who the people are that organize the periodic table. So the first guy, his name was Mosley, and he organized it by mass. I'm sorry. I made a mistake, guys. Mendeleev was the first guy to organize the table, and he organized it by mass. That is not the way it's organized today. The second guy was Mosley. And at this point in history, um, they figured out what the inside of the atom looked like. So they knew that atoms had protons, neutrons, and electrons, and they knew about atomic numbers, which Mendeleev um, didn't know about at his time. So Mosley's order changed a few of the elements that, like, don't go in mass order. Okay. Um, this, this name you really don't need to know. If they're asking about how it's organized today, they're usually just going to say the word modern. That means how is it organized today. 
Okay, and Mateo's question, when did the periodic table first come into play? So if we're talking about um, Mendeleev, we were in 1869. Um, and again, that's not something, that's not a date you have to know. You just have to understand that, like, the reason for them putting the elements in a chart like this is to help us um, know things about the elements that we might not. So, for example, like, when we put them in the atomic number order, um, we can tell something about their sizes and masses as we go to the right or as we go down a group. Um, we also know that if they're in the same group, they have the same chemical properties. So, um, like, if we take an element, for example, um, like cesium. You guys have never been exposed to cesium. You probably know nothing about cesium, but you know it's in group one, and you know in class we threw a piece of sodium in water and it exploded, right? So now you know that every element in that group will do the same thing in water. So you know things about the elements even if you've never worked with them before because of this chart. So that's pretty cool. Okay, um, next unit is bonding. Um, okay, so Alana's asking about, I'm going to number these. Alana's asking about the different types of bonds and how to tell if molecules are polar or nonpolar. So great question. Um, let's go through them. The first type of bond is an ionic bond. And you know it's an ionic bond if it's a metal plus a nonmetal. Just in case anybody's not sure how to tell that. The periodic table has a staircase. If you look at group 13, there's a staircase going down. Anything to the left of that staircase is a metal. Anything to the right is a nonmetal. So if you have a thing from each side, you can say the type of bond is ionic. And what happens is the electrons are transferred. So the metal will give away its electrons to the nonmetal. The metal will become a positive ion, the nonmetal will become a negative ion, and they'll stick together. They'll be attracted to each other. All right, now there's two types of covalent. We have polar covalent, and we have nonpolar covalent. So how do we know if it's a polar covalent? It's two different nonmetals. And nonpolar would be two of the same nonmetals. So both elements are from the right side of the periodic table, or hydrogen. Hydrogen is also a nonmetal, but it's over there on the left. Um, so they're going to get together and bond. It'll be a covalent bond. Now, whether they're the same or different, that tells you how the electrons are shared. Um, if it's polar, the electrons are shared unequally. So you want to think of the electrons as if they're in a tug of war. Both nonmetals are pulling on them. Both nonmetals want them. And one nonmetal is probably going to be a little bit stronger than the other. So the electrons are going to be closer to that one. So they're not like directly in the middle. They're like closer to one atom. If they're two of the same nonmetal, they're exactly the same, then they're going to have the exact same strength. So if you have a tug of war where both teams are the exact same strength, then the rope doesn't move anywhere, right? So it's the same thing with the electrons. The electrons will be perfectly in the middle, shared equally, if it's a nonpolar covalent bond. Um, the fourth type of bonding is metallic bonding, and that's if you have a metal, okay, and what the electrons are doing, it's called a sea of mobile electrons. So metals like to lose electrons, and that's literally what they do. All the metals get together, their valence electrons come off, and now there are these positive ions with these negative electrons moving all around inside them. So the positive and the negatives help keep the substance together. Okay? So those are all your different types of bonds. Okay, now her next part of the question, I'm going to run out of space here. Um, how do you tell if a molecule is polar or nonpolar? That's called molecular polarity. 
where these are all bonds. So you have to be careful about what the question is saying. Does it want to know about a bond or does it want to know about the molecule as a whole? If it's asking about the molecule as a whole, you want to use snap. If the molecule is symmetrical, like CH4 is symmetrical, if I cut it in half in any direction, it's going to be symmetrical. Symmetrical means the molecule is nonpolar. This molecule has polar bonds in it. C and H are different elements. The bonds are polar. But when I look at the whole molecule, the whole molecule is nonpolar. If the molecule is asymmetrical, like if I look at water here, if I cut water in half up and down, it looks symmetrical. But if I cut it in half this way, it's actually an asymmetrical molecule, so it would be polar. Okay. All right, so now to move to John's questions, um, how to know if something has strong or weak IMFs. Um, it depends what information you're given. Um, if there's hydrogen bonding present, which is a type of IMF, um, that means that your molecule has H in it with either F, O, or N. So if the molecule has any of that in it, then you know that there's hydrogen bonding and that's strong. Um, usually, though, the, the region's multiple choice doesn't ask you about a specific type of IMF. Usually it tells you about the properties of the substance. Um, so if it tells you that the substance has a high melting point or high boiling point, or, oh, I don't know why I put a comma there. Hold on. High boiling point. Um, if they tell you that the substance sublimes easily, that means that, like, it turns into a gas very quickly. Or if they tell you that the substance is actually a gas at STP, um, wait a second. I'm sorry, guys. We're doing strong. We're doing strong, which means we stick together. So you want to look for a solid. That's going to mean that your IMFs are strong. If they tell you there's a low melting point, a low boiling point, or that it sublimes, turns to a gas easy, or it actually is a gas at STP, that's how you know the substance has weak IMFs. And that's usually what you're given um, with something like this. Okay, I'm going to stop here and start a new video for Unit 6.